welcome to my talk, uh, Narrative Structures for Better Game Design by uh, Ranko Prifkuic, that's me. So who am I? I'm um, also known as Grandpa Tiger and uh, I'm, uh, I start from um, both uh, game development and writing backgrounds. Um, I was a game journalist, uh, then a novelist, then a creative writing teacher, but also in the same time I was a game designer, then game producer, and uh, then uh, indie activist. And I decided that since uh, structural analysis is kind of my superpower, and since I'm passionate about narratives, uh, that I should go full narrative designer. And, uh, well, maybe I should say a narrative consultant, because nowadays it seems that game writers have uh, hijacked the title of narrative designer, and I cannot blame them, because uh, game writers have be uh, for a long time been very neglected part of uh, game industry. So what basically what I do is I teach uh, traditional writers about game design and interactive uh, narration. I teach game devs about uh, principles of narratives and narration, as well as provide trainings and consultations, both for solo developers and uh, studios. Also, my marketing manager will kill me if I don't uh, mention that uh, Grandpa's narrative design is my personal branding while I'm part of the Red Viking studio, um, and we both basically focus on narrative games uh, and edutainment titles. Also, uh, stay tuned because in a Q&A session, I'm going to be handing out six-month keys for RTC Draft, a very, very useful uh, narrative tool. Uh, also good for, nar uh, for narrative design, but also for prototyping and generally for uh, game design. Uh, it's a, it's a really amazing visual database. So yeah, um, I cannot recommend them uh, high enough. So let's get down to business and first see uh, what are the differences between a writing a game and writing for a game. And you might ask like, is, I didn't know that there's a difference. Uh, so yes, there is a difference. It's a subtle one, but it's important one. Uh, primarily it's about approach. So uh, if you have a uh, case of writing a game, uh, you probably think about a game book like Choose Your Adventure, interactive fiction, a visual novel, or like adventure games uh, as a genre, uh, not just adventure games as like uh, sporting some sort of adventure. So basically, uh, these games, what, what's specific for these games is these games are written. So when you approach making these games, you start developing them as if you would develop a novel. Uh, you need a theme, you need plot, you need characters, you need the setting, you need, uh, you know, uh, narrative structures. So everything that goes into creation of a usual novel. Uh, also, what's important for this kind of games is that plot and theme are the king. We play these games to uh, read the story, to learn the story. Uh, and it's not like, oh, I, I do some gameplay and then I follow the story. No, no, no. In these games, reading and then making choices or reading and then applying some uh, actions is what the gameplay is about. Uh, these kind of games are anchored, so to speak, through the plot theme continuum. So the plot and theme are important, like what's the story going to tell you and why is a big part of uh, the, the, uh, the game. Uh, and also, uh, immersion is done through narrative. So we play these games because of the story, because we want to get uh, involved in the story of the game. Writing for a game, slightly different. So uh, usually when we say writing for a game, we think about fluff, you know, like uh, stuff that uh, is like textual design, so to speak, in a game. A lore, bestiarium, uh, wiki, uh, like quest descriptions, also all kind of copy for games, like item descriptions, what spells do, blah, blah. Also notice that I've added a dialogues as a fluff, which is blasphemous, I know. Personally, I wouldn't put it there. Dialogues, namely, are very important because they are part of the characters as a narrative element. Dialogues should propel the story forward, provide information for player, and most uh, importantly, they are a tool for characterization. 
So dialogues are super important. However, I listed them under fluff because that's usually where they're put in a, in the production, in a big scale, in a, in a pipeline. A very bad uh, choice and uh, often leading to quite uh, a bad results. But yeah, sadly, that's uh, what the state of uh, so to speak narration in games is today. So writing for a game. Uh, is um, uh, different from writing a game in that uh, narrative elements are used as a part of game design. So while there is a theme, there is plot, there are characters, obviously, and we have some sort of episodes, uh, maybe a cluster of episodes, maybe some story beats or story nodes, and we definitely have some world, you know, setting, maybe a campaign map. Uh, but uh, very important to mention here is that uh, the game here starts from something else. It doesn't start from necessarily from the story, from theme and plot. And you have to use all these narrative elements in conjunction with game design and treat them as parts uh, as your game design. Um, for example, characters are obviously very important for gameplay. Uh, players connect to the game through characters. So they need to be you know, crafted, well-crafted, well-designed, they have to have some uh, uh, good interaction as an avat avatars uh, towards the players, but also they need to be put in a context. So they need some sort of narrative structure to be part of. But these games are not written. They can be developed uh, uh, narratively in the sense that they do need structure. They do they do need uh, 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 something else than just you know uh, 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 picture. Uh, mostly. Uh, game developers show off their characters like, oh, hey, I made this character. It's a, it's a cool model. What do you think? But often you cannot think anything before you see them in the context or in some action or, um, you know, to know what these characters are about, what are their motivations, blah, blah. So, yeah, characters uh, have to be developed both as an uh, asset, as a gameplay element, and as an narrative element. So you have to give them motivations, uh, um, ethos, uh, goals, blah, blah. So basically, um, uh, these games, when you're writing for a game, these games are anchored in pillars of fantasy or in uh, uh, gameplay, in core loop. So, so you don't start from a uh, story, you don't start from theme. You start from um, uh, what your game is going to uh, impart to your players in sense of emotions. What are they going to feel? What are they going to experience? And also, when I say action verbs, I mean, what are the verbs that your game is built upon? Like, if you have a platformer, verbs obviously can be jump. I mean, Super Mario has just one verb, jump, and how far you jump, and how do you perform, and how do you time your jumps is all the gameplay there is. Of course, there are other elements that interact, but the game main game verb is jump. Uh, you can have like uh, move, jump, shoot, you know, the usual stuff. Um, so this is, this is the, something that the game is based on. And then the narrative elements have to be compliant with it, have to uh, synergize with these elements. So this is the main difference uh, how um, writing a game and writing for a game is, uh, uh, differs. And it's important because both um, angles the, the, uh, could benefit greatly from a good narrative structure. However, in a, in a case of writing for a game, they immensely add to a better game design as well. While when writing a game, narrative structures basically tell you what the game design is. It, it's, a, it's a minimalistic game design. It's like choices, but it's super important. And we'll see it exampled into uh, different uh, kind of games. So uh, what's the story uh, with structures? Why the structures? Why I constantly speak about structures and why are they so helpful? Because Structures matter a lot. Um, as we can see in the joke, there's graphite and there's diamond, and both are made of like atoms of carbon. But it's how these individual elements are connected that uh, gives the quality. And I'm not saying that graphite is like worse than diamond or something. I mean, if you want to go for superconductivity, you know, go for graphite. But if you want to go for hardness, go for diamond. So uh, not uh, the same is with stories. If you have some uh, story elements, uh, or if you want to combine your story with your gameplay, especially if you want to improve your game design by having this synergy, by bridging this ludonarrative gap, 
by not having a disconnectivity between the story and the gameplay, you need to pay big attention to structures. Because good structure will add value to the crafted elements. A bad structure can make the flaws of your individual elements uh, uh, you know, more apparent. Uh, at best and at worst, it can definitely ruin your game if you pick the wrong uh, if you pick the wrong structure. Uh, so also the structures are um, are apparently important when uh, uh, thinking about games, thinking about writing. A lot of uh, my students got bogged down in issues of uh, style and language, and it didn't improve their uh, writing. However, once we started dealing with structures. Uh, the the quality boost of their production was like 20 to 50 percent uh, per story because um, players are gonna be okay with the way your elements individually are, but they're not gonna be okay uh, if your structure is haphazard and if they cannot uh, you know uh, connect to it. Why? Because uh, structure is perception, and our perception is based on structure. Uh, we follow patterns. Uh, if you show me a stick figure, and if you show me a stick figure with a glass of whiskey, and then you show me a picture of a grave, my mind will connect the dots, and it will say, oh, this stick figure drank him or herself to death. And maybe it's not true. Maybe you just showed me three random pictures. But that's what my perception tells me. Uh, as you can see, these uh, Gestalt laws are exactly that. They are based on uh, 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 structures and us being able to recognize, does this element, you know, form a structure? Is this a structure broken? So my perception will try to, you know, bring it back together. Uh, can I discern simple elements in a, in a jungle of, uh, of, uh, of a noise? Um, what's close to, each, uh, close to each other? What's similar? What's dissimilar? What's grouped together? And these, these uh, simple principles work as well in narrative, as well as in game design. So if you, if you uh, spend a lot of time explaining to me something about some character, you cannot persuade me that this character is not uh, important, that he's not the main character. And vice versa, you have to be very careful, careful how you present your uh, elements, because structure can override your intention your intent. A great example is Sherlock Holmes, because the writer of Sherlock Holmes wanted to kill off the Sherlock, and so he invited um, Moriarty, you know, the villain, to join the, the, the show in order to kill um, Sherlock. Uh, but the audience, they said, okay, Moriarty, we never saw him commit a crime, we never uh, heard of him before, and he's supposed to be some super famous genius. He's exactly as smart and as cool as uh, Sherlock is, and then he kills Sherlock, so uh, readers declare that Moriarty is not actually a character, that he's just some evil part of Sherlock and that basically Sherlock he kills himself. And that's not what the writer wanted, but that's the pattern structures, narrative structures taking over. So be very careful about the narrative structures. Uh, again, uh, we perceive stories through the structure. Uh, that's why this uh, graph, this typical Aristotle's three-point or I don't five-point uh, structure, is still valid after thousands of years, because in essence, story is change. If the if if everything is same at the beginning at the end, then you don't have a story. Uh, story is explaining to me, to readers uh, or or players, uh, how the situation is at the beginning then guiding my perception through a series of dramatic events and then showing me why the new situation is different through this uh, peak, through this dramatic change. Uh, so that's what keeps the narrative together. But uh, three-point structure is not the only one. Uh, and most of, most of you know about hero's journey or heroine's journey, you know, the circular uh, journey, which is great, but I would recommend you watch it primarily as a way to display the change of a character because as a narrative structure it can be quite limiting uh, so yeah uh, and and uh, there's also a semiotic square quite powerful structure like uh, cinderella is based on it and it's very good for games because it doesn't burden the gameplay 
uh, him up. So you have Cinderella, who isn't a princess, doesn't look like one, and then she turns into someone who looks like a princess, but she still isn't one. And then she, you know, she's discovered, she's go, she runs away, she goes back, and then she's back to someone who's not looking like a princess, but she could become one because the prince is now interested in her. And in the end, she is a princess and she looks like one. I mentioned this because uh, this is very good structure for a lot of games because it doesn't uh, put the pressure on uh, on uh, on the dramatic developments, on the peaks. It doesn't force uh, you to follow the dynamics of gameplay, so it can be quite uh, nicely implemented. But there are also a myriad of other uh, uh, structures like uh, node-based structure or totally nonlinear structure or gestalt structure where the story uh, bits are just you know seeded and then the player uh, connects them uh, with their own action, you know, picking which one wants to follow. Uh, and in this image, you can see a narrative designer, a game designer, a game writer, producer, a lead developer, and um, bonus points to you who guess who's who, uh, who's unhappiest in here. So the problem with narratives and game design is that they are widely separated in a, in a production pipeline. Uh, simply, there is not enough attention to narrative, but also not enough attention to writing. Uh, and the problem with that is uh, mostly in ubiquity of writing. Like we are all creatures of the story. We all, uh, you know, live our life as uh, someone who's in the middle of the story. We are the main characters. Uh, we ask each other, what's up? What's going on? What's the plot of your life in this moment? So basically, everyone who feels that they are creative and they, they can speak, you know, and be understood, think that they can also write, and they write. I mean, I, I do believe that everyone can craft a story. But when it comes to games, when it comes to non-linearity, when it comes to uh, interactivity, and primarily when it comes to structures, it does require some skills and some, uh, you know, attention. And uh, many uh, studios and developers are sort of like... It is important, but we it's probably not that important. We cannot be bothered. And then, you know, uh, they keep writers and game designers separated or ask uh, game writers to uh, intervene in game design or, God forbid, game designers to write something. Uh, it, can, it can be really a mess, especially because keeping track of the structures could help not only narrative designers, but also uh, everyone else because it allows for better synergy between the elements. And story usually is like a novel sized. So it's easier to keep off this big forest of, of, uh, of a narrative if you have a solid structure. So uh, speaking of structures, uh, maps are quite important here. Uh, and I'll show you different kinds of maps, which are not only uh, visual uh, in sense of uh, uh, graphs, but also they can be uh, like uh, any kind of organized text. Uh, because it's not easy, you know, to keep uh, to keep the pipeline uh, in, in this disjointed way. So I do suggest you find uh, the best way you can to, you know, uh, retain control over the nonlinearity of the stories. Uh, Artis is one of the one of the uh, uh, tools, but it, it can be uh, there. There are many other uh, very nice tools, and in the end, it can be you can see it can be a simple Word, you know, or Excel, uh, as long as you, you know have the intention to keep the maps. So basically, if structure is the key, uh, maps mapping is the way. So uh, this, here's for example of, um, of uh, structures uh, and structure map, because this represents like um, uh, three, uh, so, uh, the usual three act structure in, in different ways. Uh, if you cannot see this clearly, it doesn't matter. Just uh, 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 to show you how many interpretations of this simple three-point uh, structures uh, there can be. Um, basically, everyone will have some sort of their own, uh, uh, um, so to say, flavor. Uh, is it uh, is it a Act One setup, Act Two confrontation, Act Three resolution? Is it like um, you know, uh, setup debate, fun and games, bad guys coming in? All is lost. Then you know resurrection. Then finale. So whatever you want to to to, to call it, whatever you want to track it, it's important to have some sort of way to uh, have a structure and map it out. For example, um, uh, it's uh, it's. Uh, 
The interactivity and non-linearity add a complexity to the structures for games. For example, these are two basic structures for visual novels, for example. And, and again, this is very simplified because it doesn't show you the, the full uh, game flow. It doesn't show you the full episode uh, flow. But this is just to show you how the uh, story changes. So, for example, all these branches uh, represent the significant difference between plot uh, arches, so to speak. So, for example, we have this core story, the red uh, red line. Then we have this blue, uh, green, and yellow uh, story arcs. Then we have these little dramatic uh, moments, uh, episodes, and then we have these little endings. So, it's really simple but efficient way to keep track of how your narrative changes, how your narrative arcs change. Uh, uh, so we have this uh, uh, really high level, so to say, concept of, of keeping track of what's, what's going on where. Uh, here is, of course, a bit more detailed, the map. Um, so the map and structures can be quite complex. Like this is the episode structure, and it's almost impossible to read. And you can see there's a, each box is one episode, and then there are lines showing you where it can go. With, with, with each uh, episode, and there's like a red, green, uh, yellow pill shaped uh, little endings that represent good, bad, and you know, so so endings. But also, notice how the episodes are color coded, like uh, several episodes be uh, be uh, be uh, belonging to different parts of the plot structure. Uh, like, is it uh, does it the story belong to the introduction? Does it belong, does it the episode uh, belong to the story's exposition? A rising action, uh, etc. Whatever you, uh, whatever st structure you decide to go with, and of course this is not the end because this uh, this map can be even more complex if you keep track of individual choice stations because each episode um, has their own goals, of course, and they're all uh, peaks and and dramatic change, and of course uh, from in, in each episode they can be um, uh, many different uh, choice stations, and. I know it gets super complicated after some time, but it's super important to keep focus and to keep track on what's going on where. How is your story, which is highly interactive and highly non linear how is it holding together? A lot of writers think that if you write a wide story where stories can you know, go here and there, that that's a good way. But then you can lose uh, a thematic uh, and narrative um, coherence and uh, and uh, a structure in sense that then the player has to go through five stories in, in rolled up in one and that's going to create a lot of pressure on the way player connects things and the way uh, their perception is entertained so that's why i always suggest that uh, you know keep the theme strong if you're writing a game or keep your narrative in tight connection with your pillars of fantasy like what do you want players to do in your game uh, but either way, uh, these maps are really, really uh, super important and, and, and super uh, powerful. And this is, for example, um, a game flow map, which almost looks like a, a level map for some game. And that's, that's perfectly fine because you can decide your flow is like a location based. You can, uh, uh, it can be a node based for, uh, for stories. But it's quite usual, uh, useful for mapping adventure games or other narrative games where, where there's a lot of uh, freedom of movement, freedom of action. And then you can uh, sort of layer on top of it a player's perception. So this is something, for example, this is like a map of the game flow structure. And this is something I would call a perception map. Why? Because it keeps track on what player knows at what which moment. So, for example, in these boxes, letters I represent like this is still a part of introduction. So maybe player can move quite far away through locations, but the story is still in introductory phase. Then you can have like E1, E2, E3, etc. to like ex exposition episodes. So maybe player will move here and there, but they will unlock, so to say, uh, exposition part of the narrative uh, conditioned with you know uh, other stuff and then we can have episodes like so1 so2 so3 variants and it all leads towards some sort of peak uh, conclusion c1 c uh, c1a and of course ultimately you know one of the endings so uh, it's quite important because it can help you keep track of what player knows at what which moment how do players movement through game and the game flow uh, connect to your narrative so that you don't have 
uh, diamond uh, gateways as your only solution. Namely, a lot of uh, game design uh, tries to gateway narrative in very tight spots, like creating a, a factory a pinches or like a, a, a gateways. And then, you know, players can explore, 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 and then can go through this one gate, which, which is cool, but doesn't work for a lot of games. And breaking out of this mold did wonders for The Witcher, because if you, did, if you didn't notice, Witcher 1 had this amazing way of, you know, continuously telling you the story, no matter how the levels shift. So you go here, you go there, you explore freely, and then the story is like, uh, disappear, catch up, reappear. The, the, the quests are spread through the whole game, which is, I think, amazing way to connect the narrative and, uh, and the gameplay. So here we have um, another example, uh, what the perception map is uh, like. So you see it doesn't have to be uh, uh, graphs and graphics. This is for one of the games I'm going to uh, 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 present to you today. So for example, you see, so let's focus it on the content here. We have introductory part of the structure, and then we have like what the player needs to know. So for example, wearing the less clothes is more proper than wearing more clothes because it's an alternative world. It's a, it's a different uh, kind of story. So sovereigns, some kings that the player questions are not doing good job because of the quarrel. So that's something we need to learn in the introduction before we actually meet the kings. So player uh, is youngling, it has no affiliation towards day workers or night workers. What are the day workers and night workers? Okay, so we have to introduce it early to the player. So uh, what I call the perception map is just another word for keeping track of what player knows so they can keep following the story. So same goes for the exposition, like what are the important things to know, uh, the first episode, the second episode, et cetera, et cetera. So it can be a simple a list of things that you need to uh, plant early. Because in narrative, uh, if you want something to explode, to have a big impact, you have to plant it as early as possible. Uh, also, the game I'm, uh, which this is expert is um, Clara Rashka's interactive fiction game, uh, uh, Land of No Twilight. And it's, it's one of the two games I'm going to present to you right away. So, um, Land of uh, No Twilight is basically uh, made, made by uh, Clara Rashka, a very talented erotic fiction uh, writer and game designer. It's a romance game uh, with some fantasy elements, and it's delivered in form of interactive fiction, which means that basically, you know, reading is the gameplay. So players reading, making choices, and uh, thus progressing. And um, game design in this kind of game is the composition of the choice stations. So how relevant are the choices? How well paced are the choices? Um, how impactful are they? Will I pick something that will make an impact in, the, in a game's, uh, game uh, space or not? So uh, game design for this was uh, quite a challenge because she needed to uh, put a, a, a story which is strong, which does have some uh, uh, um, non-linearity, but the question was, what will the player do? Uh, what will the player uh, be engaged through? Uh, anchors uh, of this game, and I mentioned them because intent uh, of the author embodied in anchors is of utmost importance. So her inner motive is something we dealt with first, and we came to the two teams, front team like old versus young, wisdom of old versus impetus uh, of the young, prejudices, uh, etc. And that's why she crafted a story which follows a young woman unhappy with two kings, challenges them in order to replace both, and then she ends up either alone uh, or with one of them uh, winning, you know, becoming a queen or not. So that was the, like the, the, the basic idea of her story. The second game I want to present is uh, Let Bions Be Bygones by Georgi Markovic. And he's uh, making amazing futuristic noir detective story, uh, sort of cyberpunk noir, with point and click gameplay elements and very strong narrative focus. And uh, here's uh, how it looks. Um, and he's really talented. He, he, this is animated, you know, it's, it's not a, I didn't want to present you with GIFs or anything. It just complicates the presentation for me. But believe me, this pixel art is cool and it has even cooler narration, um, uh, animation. But uh, the gameplay is like two thirds is uh, in, in, in the visual style, visual elements, and one third is this, in this narrative elements. And game is played sort of as point and click game. But uh, he wanted to have anchors uh, like fantasy pillars. So I want to make a strong uh, uh, game 
uh, resembling the LucasArts kind of games. He wants to be uh, into cyberpunk, detective stuff. He wants to, one of the characters to be a bion, artificial intelligence uh, uh, person. But also he wanted a gameplay which is smooth. So no inventory puzzles, no crazy disjointed uh, puzzles where you have to you know do all kinds of crazy stuff which is, does, doesn't connect to narrative. So strongly narrative game, but also you know smooth running adventure. Challenge for him was that uh, he had quite a linear story, but he wanted to create a lot of open world and a lot of interactivity for his uh, audience. So let's let's review the story timeline. As you can see, it's quite linear. So uh, main character uh, 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 is um, uh, Lucy. She's a bionic entity, this bion. She goes from some rich area to the pit where the uh, player lives in the pit, you know, in this uh, very, very bad, poor, uh, dark noir kind of environment. She parties, she runs away. Then an, a, a rich lady hires a detective. He starts an investigation, keeps track. Uh, you know, she gets in all kinds of troubles. She's abused, goes berserk, kills everyone. You know, detective discovers the narrative, uh, the massacre starts uh, investigating on and on. So uh, uh, my point is linear, linear, linear. It's a detective story. So his structure had to be first, uh, you know, set like, okay, what's the prologue? Uh, let's see, let's have a small episode meeting the landlord. Let's have a, a little flashback as a prologue. Let's have a, a part of introduction as a part of the plot structure, like how is he hired, uh, exploring a little bit in the office. Then let's have exposition basically you know, first moves, first uh, puzzles, first uh, player interactions with, uh, with the world, Try, uh, doing the detective work, uh, you know, introducing the little of characters, gathering clothes, blah, 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 again, ending with the flashback and so on and so on. So, so if this linear structure was uh, uh, like what happened, this is like a plot structure which sort of keeps um, open towards player interacting with the world. So we decided to draft an episodes map so we have how the prologue is going on, like, okay, in the office and in the flashback, in the old office. Introduction is going to be in one location. But this one location will have uh, several interactions. Like in prologue, uh, you're being attacked by this uh, uh, landlord who demands you to pay. Uh, and it defines, like, the way you react to the world, the way you interact with the uh, with, uh, 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 dialogues. Like, are you a jerk? Are you a nice guy? Do you pull gun on them? Are you trying to be violent? Uh, so it's it's like really really cool tutorial slash prologue to the story, and as you can see already in chapter one we have this uh, introduction of the open world. So the, the remember the structure of a story is uh, the story itself is linear. The structure of the story pr uh, provides for m moments where player can you know visit all these uh, uh, locations and do something, and then we decided to draw episodes map because we want to see what locations are basically our episodes. So player can leave the office, go to the metro station, go to the bus, go to the market, go to the pub where the, 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 the event happened, main event happened. They can explore each location. There's going to be scenes in each, uh, sub scenes for each episode where the player has some sort of interactions, a little narrative based puzzle, so to speak, when he can learn more about the stuff. And then of course it ends uh, when he reaches the pub and then the story goes on. Uh, so this uh, basically helped uh, uh, author to envision how his linear story is going to be interactive for the player, how this linear story is going to be open uh, to the player to do stuff and not just, you know, follow the, follow the, the line. Uh, in the land of no twilight, as you can see, it has quite a linear uh, game flow. So the player reads, 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 reaches the, you know, big, uh, important uh, uh, change where you know story dramatically changes in one or other aspect then there's a continuation uh, you know second episode big episode and then a player again makes one big decision of course there, there are gonna be you know many choice uh, choice stations in between again you know do they enter a relationship or not that's the big big deal the story dramatically changes there and in the end uh, at the peak of drama, we have this chance, like, do, do, does the player interact, uh, accept help or not, which is a crucial value that the game supports, like, do you as a youngling accept uh, help from the older elders? Yes, no, and it sort of sorts out the, the, the endings. Uh, and the challenge here was uh, 
what's player gonna do? Is, is it gonna be just like a, a linear experience where the story is linear, where the gameplay is also linear? How to add um, uh, game design uh, elements into this? Because here we don't have world, we don't have even graphics, it's just text and choices. How do we uh, use a narrative structure and mapping out the structure to improve the game part of the experience of this interactive fiction, for example. And um, one of the solutions was to see what's the episode structure. Maps, maps, I tell you guys, the maps are, are really the key. So we started by um, uh, ma uh, pl mapping out the structure. So basically what you saw up there uh, as a uh, one line, here it's a uh, it's, um, uh, cut into like a, a, a cardinal episodes. So we have a prologue, we have a beginning. Okay, beginning is where the story is uh, being uh, introduced, like what kind of world it is, what kind of characters it inha it, it's inhabited by, uh, what are the cultural differences between our world and the other world, because she, uh, she to, to make things more interesting, she has this uh, plant-based people, you know, living in. So there's like a night-based plants and day-based plants and they have a night king and the day king and that's the pillar of her story, so to speak. So all these elements need to be introduced very gently. That's why beginning has like six episodes. Yeah, six if I count correctly. And then um, another thing is her exposition is quite long because uh, these elements need to, needs to be um, uh, developed, not only deployed, uh, but also we need to have this uh, 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 sequence of episodes which we slowly build towards the, the, the a moment where, so to speak, the story really picks up. And this exposition is, exposition is important because we wanted to uh, make um, character-based uh, 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 gameplay. And visual novel character-based gameplay means that um, common route or this main story, which is always the same, is quite a long one because events happen in the same way but through choices the characters uh, characterization slowly uh, uh, changes like character either matures or changes or learns something or gets some skills or gets some affiliations so basically we wanted to have this longish exposition uh, not only as a, as a as something that is important for the narrative but also something which is important for gameplay because we wanted to put a player through different situations where they can decide for themselves uh, what do they want to be like. And, and basically then we said, okay, a uh, list of the episodes is uh, 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 like in this, um, so to say, motor of the story uh, part of the, of the rising action of the game. Uh, this, this is what I call the episodes here. So there's like six basic episodes in the sense that there's a, some challenges that the player goes through and it's like formalized and it's both in the story and the gameplay sense quite streamlined and then we have this peak of drama where all the values all the variables all the flags are being sort of summed up and then the game sort of um sorts you sorts the player towards one of the endings and if this was a um, typical uh, uh, visual novel in sense that the typical in the way they are made like only story, no gameplay, only, you know, write, 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 uh, don't plan out, don't have structure, then the only replayability value for this game and only playability value, I would also say, only gameplay value would be how the story ends. But because it's a long uh, route, common route, uh, and it has to be because it's uh, it's a character based, so the events uh, are always stay the same, but the character is changed slowly. Uh, and if you, if you recall, the story requires change. It's a pillar of the story. So basically, player would have only the option to, you know, like go through the whole story again and again and again. And then, you know, the player would have to, you know, like make the save somewhere between the peak of drama and just play the endings. And that's like totally killing the immersion because we want to play this story to play this story. We want to play this story. And so in the end, we decided to uh, have a map uh, map of values. And this is like very simplified uh, version because, you know, detailed map is quite complex. Um, so with basically what we did is to uh, see what are the values uh, that we want to uh, expose our player to. Uh, and first, 
uh, uh, first natural uh, thing that came to mind, of course, you see these black and white uh, uh, episodes. We wanted to have some sort of uh, test if uh, players affiliated with the day, uh, day, day, night, uh, day, uh, day workers or night workers, uh, day people or night people, because you know I told you there are some sort of plants and and some are affiliated with day and some are affiliated with night. And she as a youngling is still not affiliated with. And then we have some sort of uh, situations, choice stations, where she can again and again decide in each individual uh, choice station uh, is she more inclined towards the lifestyle values uh, outlook of the day workers or the night workers and it can uh, later uh, sort of make it easier for her to romance day day king or night king uh, so it's not only um, about gathering some sort of points that will in the peak of drama decide where to go in the end but it's also a customized experience for the player because um, game design, how well uh, how well game design is made in this kind of game, is all about can player live with their choices, or they feel insecure and want to you know save game after each choice. Can you make a design of these choices so smooth that player can really stand behind each uh, of them? Uh, so dramatic choice, uh, again, another really important thing. Dramatic choice, and and gameplay is a sequence of making dramatic choices. That's what the, 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 the core of the game is. It's not only about being in trouble, you know, not being sure what to choose. A dramatic choice is not, is not only about being in a, in a personal drama of like, oh, what did I choose? It's about uh, really uh, being immersed in it and deciding to make tough decisions and stand by it and not b to be kicked out of it by you know, having desire to save game and then play it safe. So, uh, so yeah, we, we decided to, to introduce different values which will customize the experience of the player. And one of the value was this uh, black and white, but the other value was uh, attitude towards uh, uh, someone who's uh, more experienced and no older than you, because that's connected to the theme. And then part of the game design is part of our uh, narrative design, because we have strong theme. It's not the main theme, it's one of the themes, but it's sort of uh, embodied in a, in a game design because player uh, does go through these uh, situations uh, and, and, and choice stations, which sort of collect the information uh, how the, the player react towards this, uh, this particular set of values. And then the journey, although the main story doesn't uh, uh, move away, doesn't branch out, the journey, the episodes are slightly different. The characters are slightly different. So, uh, so to speak, um, the, the, the game flow is the same, but the experience is quite rich and quite varied. And player can play through again and again and have different uh, decisions each time. And of course, the, the last one, uh, the last set of values was like, is it going to be romance or respect? Like, how do you approach this, uh, these two kings? And of course, it's built up through this uh, beginning and exposition. So basically, um, Narrative structures not only keep you uh, uh, in loop with the, uh, the story and help you uh, visualize the story, keep track of the individual elements, uh, make them work together in, in a better way, make them more uh, synergized, but they can immensely help you with your game design choices because uh, narrative structures can strongly root you in like, what do you want to create? What are your anchors? What are your themes? What's your uh, pillar of your game? Uh, for example, I had really uh, good experience. Uh, someone asked me like, okay, but I want to have a story in a racing game. How do I do it? What's your game about? Racing. What the player does, just drives. Uh -huh. So this kind of game maybe doesn't even need a story, but it may need a story element. So what's the structure of your gameplay? What's the structure of your game flow? Uh -huh, it's this, player drives through levels and you know, like a journey, like travels towards some maybe undiscovered or, or, or uh, unannounced goal. But then we can see what are the pillars of this game. Uh, is, is the player feeling powerful when they drive? Is the player feeling rebellious when they drive? Is the player feeling uh, chased? Or is the player feeling in danger? Is the player feeling like, oh, this is too difficult? Uh, 
or whatever. So we take this emotion from a pillar of a game, and then we say, okay, from all the narrative elements, we only need a theme. We'll, we'll craft story through the theme. So there will not be a plot. And it's especially important for you, all you guys who are do, working on live ops games. If you make a live ops games, plot is a killer. You know, plot has, uh, is, is gonna mess up with your life because plots are final. The, 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 it's, it, yeah, it's possible to have uh, episodes, uh, you know, TV, telenovelas, a gazillion of episodes. But these episodes, if you recall, they don't have a plot. They basically are grounded in characters, in relations. And if you map it out, it will be much easier to connect your uh, gameplay with, uh, with the content that can be provided again and again and again. So uh, thank you for uh, listening to my talk. Um, I guess we're off to a QA session now. Thank you, Ranko, for your lecture. And we have a few questions from the audience. Uh, I'll try to forward them as clearly to you as I can. Mm -hmm. The first one is for Gleb. It's uh, what type of narrative makes more sense from a suspension of disbelief point of view? Uh, the first option is indirect, as in Dark Souls. And the second option is ding ding, Sam, by the way, do you remember this? Uh, as uh, Kojima does. Um, again, I would have to say it depends on um, what do you want to create. Uh, why do you want to create suspension of, belief, of disbelief? And uh, generally suspension of disbelief is created through uh, uh, interaction of your narrative and gameplay elements to, for, for them both to narrate. Uh, a lot of people think that stories only narrate. But uh, gameplay elements can also narrate, like uh, a map can, can lead to choices. Do I go this way or that way? Um, so basically you have to know what do, you want to, what do you want to express with your gameplay and then complement it with, uh, with the narrative elements. Um, I wouldn't say that there is like a universal solution to, to, this, uh, to this question because you will really need to see what works as a game design for your game, and then to see how your game design keeps your player immersed, and then tailor your narrative elements to this game. I hope this answers your question. Uh, thank you. The next question is from uh, Serge. What do you think mm -hmm. of an instrument to immerse player? When should we use it, and when should we avoid it? Uh, what what I didn't hear what what I uh, what as an instrument to immerse player. Ah, to instrument to immerse player. Uh, well, uh, the best instrument to immerse player is actually uh, your um, intention to immerse player. And uh, what I mean by that is to slowly, slowly introduce uh, elements of your game and your story to the player and also to find ways to connect them slowly. Uh, that's how you build the immersion. Basically, uh, no one's gonna give you uh, their full attention and full immersion immediately. And it's not done only through audiovisual uh, uh, um, uh, elements. It's done by slowly seducing your player into giving up uh, their reality and, and so supplementing it with, with the uh, reality of your game. So I would say that's another thing why uh, narrative structures are important because they can help you code the perception of the audience and guide the perception of the audience. And that's what this seduction is about, how to lure the player in. Uh, uh, to do that, you need to know what are you offering? What emotions are you offering? What experience are you offering? And then to slowly entice player to you know, follow, follow your way. Thank you. We have a couple of questions from Ainura. Mm -hmm. uh, first one is how to tell when you're over explaining your story and is it bad? And the second is contrary to the previous one, uh, is intentionally, intentionally ambiguous writing uh, good or bad? And how to tell if it works for your uh, narrative pace or gameplay? Uh, I would say that um... Ambiguity is never good because it forces audience to be creative. And unless you give them 
tools to be creative, like in Minecraft, uh, it's never a good idea to, to push creative part uh, onto your audience. So for example, if I tell you a story and then I tell you like, oh, imagine what happened next, uh, you know, like in, tell, me, tell me the rest of the story, it's, it's gonna be very difficult. You, you can really lose your audience because they're here to be entertained. They took your game, took your story to be entertained. You can tease them. You can uh, uh, um, entice them to imagine what could happen. I mean, uh, the best way to know if you're ever explaining yourself to answer you the, the first part of the question as well is to see if your players have this question or feeling of what happened next. Oh my God, I want to know what happened next. What happened next? Uh, what's, going, what's going to happen next? Maybe this, maybe that. But this... This maybe this, maybe that is, is sort of a bonus that you give to them. Don't ask them to invent what's going to happen next. So I would say don't be ambiguous. You can trick them like maybe it's this, but no, it's that. Uh, that's a good way. But don't, uh, don't uh, rely on audience building up on your stuff. A lot of writers will like write two thirds of the, of the scene and force player to imagine the, 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 the rest. Um, and I'll give you a secret. No matter how well you write, no matter how well you tell the story, there's always going to be more uh, to be placed in the player's imagination. So give me as much as possible. Uh, give me everything so I can, you know, supplement it with my own. Don't ask player to um, to do your work, basically. So that's why uh, it's it's quite important to um, really, really, really try to be as uh, uh, less a uh, little ambiguous as possible yes it is a good tool for some moments but uh, i wouldn't call it ambiguities for example you can craft your story in such a way that players can still have several options and still like guess what's going to happen uh, detective stories do it well like who's the killer and then slowly it's narrowing the, the the possibilities are narrowing down and that's what creates the suspense but don't leave it ambiguous uh, especially goes goes uh, for the endings. The endings, uh, yes, you can leave them open, but you also need to give them something to catch, something to grab onto, something to have a sort of a feeling of um, closure. I hope this answers your question. Thank you for your answers and for your lecture. Unfortunately, we don't have much time left. Sure. So uh, I think uh, uh, I skipped some questions, and if you want to, you can ask uh, Ranko with this context that he provided. So uh, thank you, and see you next time. Thank you.